And folks, welcome back. We're back. Weekly webinar. Dr. James, Dr. Mike. Mike, I spent like this whole fucking weekend chopping down trees for my neighbor. I have so much wood. Brother, I got wood. I can't wait to see your wood. Um, is your neighbor paying you? No, but I got to harvest her wood. So it's kind of a win-win. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of sketchy because she had like a bunch of trees that were between her house and like a fence. So it wasn't just like have at it. It was like, oh no, if we uh, fuck this up, that house is going to be in nice. trouble. So luckily Holy we shit. got them down like a glove. And then I spent quite a bit of time chopping them shits up. So got are you enjoying out. that kind of shit? I do. You know, like uh, it's it would be hard to say that I enjoy physical labor, but it's one of those things I find satisfying. Um, you know, it's like, it's like lifting, like, you know, it's like, you know, do you really enjoy it? It's like, no, I don't really enjoy it, but there's something about it that is compelling and I feel a great desire to do it. And I feel satisfied when it's over. It's that same kind of feeling. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I've been up to. How about yourself? Oh, I'm done with the bodybuilding show. And even though my face is no longer tan, my body kind of is. Uh, and I'm... Uh, uh, I have a DEXA today, so we'll see how that goes. Oh, uh, that's fine. Post about it, yeah. Uh, <coughs> I love to point uh, out your, my penis whenever you get a scan like that. Like, look, you know, there it is. Mine really never shows up, man. It's just oh. not thinking of it. Um, it's like, like a to, pubic bone, and that's it. And I'm like, I like to pretend like I'm a hotshot exercise physiologist. Like, oh yes, what was that number on my right arm? Oh look, there's my dick. They're like, sir, get out of here, sir. This is borderline harassment. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, definitely. All right. I am uh I'm ready. All, All right. right. Andrew Atkinson. Right at the top. Nice. And he says she was from England because he's a very is a very English name. Mm. He he would be a man who fights for his queen's army. <laughs> All right. The one and only queen. Oh, yes. Hi, Docs. I have a question regarding soreness. I know we don't want to have overlapping soreness one session to the next for muscle and don't want to train sore, which is the rating system is for on the MPT, the old physique temper. But how sore is too sore? Like if legs recover and aren't sore by the session, but the doms the day after training is crippling, and getting out of a chair is a struggle. Is that too sore, even though by the next session, soreness is minimal, if any? So, so Andrew, minimal is not any. Those are two very different things. If you have soreness and you generally don't want to train now, minimal training, minimal soreness, you can train through once or twice. What James and I always say is don't make it a regular thing. So if you did a whole mess of five weeks and every time you trained when you were sore, you did a bad thing. It's probably not a good, now, as you're probably going to be fine. It's not that bad of a thing, but it's just not a good going forward strategy to use. So soreness should be healed completely. Perceptive soreness should be gone to zero, ideally every time you train and it, if it's not, then you're either training too much in one session or doing too many sessions. Um, and so uh, now, if you get super radically crazy sore, but then you heal completely by the next session and you're not training once a week, you're training at least twice a week, that's totally cool. That's totally fine. Like there's nothing uh, damn thing wrong with that. Actually, that's almost ideal. That means you're getting wildly disrupted and incredibly well recovered. Uh, a lot of people who don't grow well, uh, from my experience, tend to not get very sore. Uh, at all, like their pulsatility. If you measure soreness on some kind of rating scale, it never goes like this. It's just like me. Uh, people who tend to grow the most, in my experience, are people who get really fucked up and then heal really fast. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you take anabolics, uh, you don't get any less sore. Usually, your soreness just goes away faster, which is like a really, really good sign. So it's kind of a best of all worlds. And he says, also, oh, sorry, go ahead, James. I was just going to say, and, and I think most people kind of fall in the middle where if they get crippling soreness, it lingers for a little while, which is why we typically say like, don't train to the point of being like what you know, we jokingly call cripplingly sore. It's not that it's inherently bad. And Mike and I aren't prudes about training hard. I think a lot of people often accuse evidence-based people of being kind of prude in terms of hard training. You should train hard and you should be pretty sore from time to time. But most people, if they get to that point where they're like, can't sit down, that's going to linger around for a few days. It's not going to go away right away. But if it does, that's great. And as Mike said, that's a pretty ideal situation. Yep. And then he says, also, how far into the mess cycle are you changed? The more sore in peak week is okay, for example. Totally. And the thing is, peak week doesn't interfere with anything. The first part of peak week, you don't want to go too crazy. But the second part of peak week, 
I mean, you can overlap into deload soreness wise if it's okay. Don't go ham and go nuts, as James and I have covered this before. Peak week is not an excuse to do all you usually do. Just add a set to everything, you'll be totally fine. Because remember, you can do so much in one session that literally interferes with anabolism directly by causing too much damage for you to have to fix. It's like doing a, a spring house cleaning and breaking the foundation of your house down with a sledgehammer. Like, mm, it's not any more clean now. It's it's just uh, broken. So there are limits to that. But yeah, generally you can do a little bit more. Um, and then he says, edit for context, doing four weekly sessions in lower body twice a week, Tuesday and Friday. Would also like to hear your general thoughts on this too. Apologies if this is covered in recovering from training book. Ha ha ha. I don't know if it is. Uh, general thoughts on you doing four, four weekly sessions, lower body four twice weeks. a week. Sounds fine. Sounds just fine. Yeah. So ideally, you know, I train legs also. I literally, Jared Feather and I train legs Tuesday and Friday. Oh, I see. And we, yeah, we consider, we consider uh, uh, it a really, you know, active thing when after like Wednesday, we're feeling a little like a little so Thursday, mostly gone. Friday, super fresh. We hit it again Friday and then Saturday, we feel pretty fucked up. Sunday's like eh, healing a little bit. Monday's pretty damn well healed. And then Tuesday is completely good to go. That's it. So yeah, if you're if you're getting overlapping soreness, yeah, minimal is you know what minimal minimal do less do less focus on quality not quantity. Soreness is always and everywhere the biggest factor for soreness is how much you do. Okay, so do less, uh, and you'll have better results. And if you and one last point on this too is if you find yourself having to do a lot to get to the point of where you feel disrupted and you're getting sore, where you're you're having to do like over ten sets per muscle group on those leg days. That's as Mike said. Sometimes it's not about quantity. It is about quality in many cases. And in this case, you might choose higher SFR movements and, or you might consider just adding a day for that particular muscle group, like do quads three times a week and have one of them be like an easy going day, um, something like that. Beautiful advice. Like for me, for biceps, there's nothing I can do to get them sore, short of like 15 sets. And then I know it's just way too much damage and I'm so tired and it's all junk volume. So I do biceps three times a week, eight sets each time, and then it solves the problem big time. So yeah. Bingo. All right. Great question from Andrew. Next up is... Profit fear. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, it's a serious name. Why am I not seeing it? Like profit, like P R O F I T? P R O P H E T. Uh, oh, profit. Yeah. I'm th I was thinking like money profit. That's what I usually. <laughs> Got it. Um, all right. So this is actually going to be a relatively quick question because I have a video reference to give for this. And I think this is still valuable because people can learn a lot if they don't know about it. Profit Fear says, I'm going to be quick. Uh, so will we, Profit Fear. We got you right back. Um, thoughts on John Meadows' video on range of motion. Uh, TLDR, John and Mike's former opponent, Kaz. See, when I hear Kaz, I think Bill Kazmaier, but that's- I have never, are you kidding me? I would be honored to die by Bill Kazmaier's hand. Um, that can't be right. Oh, though. Cass, maybe Cass. Coach Cassum, maybe? I don't know. Okay. That's my best guess. I uh, have said on record that evidence uh, on ROM is mixed. Yes, it's mixed, but highly tilted towards full ROM. John says using full ROM uh, or partial depends on the exercise and feel. Third opinion. So my entire opinion uh, on range of motion and its limitations is in a YouTube video called The Case Against Full ROM. It's on RP Strength YouTube. So just, just Google it. The Case Against Full ROM. If you watch it, but it's unlikely you will have any further questions about range of motion. The, the TLDR of that video is full range of motion is the standard baseline assumption until and unless the stimulus to fatigue ratio of a partial of some kind is reliably better. So like if you get uh, better pumps, uh, better tension, better burn, and a better perturbation from a partial version of an exercise than the full one in the target muscle, and also you get less uh, of every kind of fatigue, most specifically joint and connective tissue fatigue, then that James and I would never in a million years tell you to do full ROM because it's objectively worse. Uh, but usually that's not the case. And nine times out of 10, we take people through full ROM. They're like, oh my fuck, my pump, my tension, my blah, blah, blah is crazy. My joints feel great. Um, so most of the time, most people doing partial ROM are just excusing it. John Meadows is not one of those people. Usually when he has a partial ROM exercise, it really is because he's so tuned into his SFR. So uh, it's definitely, I, I think that's, 
I think that's the last word on the subject, but uh, and that means John and I are largely in agreement there. Uh, James, anything to sprinkle in? Yeah, and I just think this is one of those, uh, an advanced consideration. And by advanced, we're talking about people who are late in their kind of physique and or bodybuilding career, and they're really looking to eke out as much out of each session as they can because they've kind of exhausted all of their other intensity techniques and general volume intensity manipulations. This is not something that you would generally start a beginner or intermediate lifter on. You would probably keep them doing full ROM for as long as they can until they get to the point where they are so dialed in to their mind muscle yes. connections and they start having some of the major constraints that advanced lifters has that you might start entertaining that. So this is one of those things where like if you're watching this and you're like, oh, Mike and James think that you know partials are okay. It's like, yeah, we do, but not for you. <laughs> <laughs> you're not qualified to be doing partials. I'm not even um me neither. I do full ROM. I don't do any partials, sure. right? It doesn't help me. Sure. So yeah. So like, uh, James, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up. And we have other videos in this, like beginner versus intermediate versus advanced. And we're going to have more videos on this later. There's a progression in hypertrophy long-term athlete development. The first thing you learn as a beginner is technique. And that means full range of motion in almost every case. Then you learn how to train hard. Like once your technique, you can't do one without the other. Like you can't do one before the other. You can't train hard when your technique is non-existent or sucks because you're just training wrong. First, you pick up technique. Then you learn how to train hard. And then you pick up the mind muscle connection of like, okay, where's the tension? So on and so forth. Only when you've picked that up, can someone actually use the mind muscle connection with you and really tailor SFR. So a lot of the, the concept behind stimulus to fatigue ratio, a lot of beginners would look at it and be like, I don't even know if I'm experiencing these things. Like, do I get tension at the target muscle? And James and I would usually say, look, let me show you see your squat. And it's just a deep squat, high power. Like, You're fine. Like, your quads are going to grow. Keep doing when, that. Yeah, that's it. It's just great technique. Keep learning then eventually learn how to grind. Okay. And then when you learn how to grind, then eventually you can learn, okay, am I grinding with or with my glutes? But don't worry, everything will be way bigger by then. And that's when it actually matters. Like it's so funny when people who weigh like, and no offense to anywhere, I'll start at small. I started at small and almost all of you I started at hundred pounds. I'll just use myself when I was hundred pounds, you know, I didn't luckily have the audacity to be like, oh, is this squat going to make my glutes or quads bigger? Look, the fuck you give a shit for? You don't have any glutes and quads. <laughs> like, you know, people who are starving aren't like, oh, there's too much sauce in this pasta and this is really chicken or it looks like beef. Like they just eat, motherfucker. Like, so a lot of times it's you got to not earn in some moralistic, like you got to fucking earn the right to do my most connection, brother. You literally have to grow into it. And only then does it become apparent to you that you have the skill set to decide. Another quick analogy is like, uh, uh, someone who's been wrestling for three months or doing jujitsu for three months is like, all right, what's my game plan? Motherfucker, you don't have a game plan. You don't know any don't game. Die. Just and do the fun. one takedown. <laughs> don't die. <laughs> Take him down. Remember that one thing? Double leg. Do the double leg. That's the only thing you know. <laughs> so, but, it, but you know, I will say everyone likes to feel advanced, right? James, like beginners love asking advanced questions because it makes them feel oh, like I'm in the know, like I'm part of the advanced group. Like, eh. Yeah, the, the goal is not necessarily to be advanced because when you're advanced, everything sucks. Your training yeah. is needlessly complicated. It's not like you're yeah. doing advanced training because you get more gains out of it. You're doing advanced training because you have to. People think advanced means better. It doesn't mean better. It just means like this is the new minimum standard that you have to hit in order to have progress. 100%. 100%. All right, next up is a perennial <laughs> perennial finalist. Mont oh, Montas. I knew it was coming. I was like, it's got to be him. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I skip there we go. Mantas says, he's got a question uh, that is, how can you know if you're completely recovered after a deload at the end of a macro cycle, if you change most of the exercise and rep ranges at the start of, new mac of the new macro cycle? Great question. Mm. Easy answer. You do uh, an active rest phase at the end of a macro cycle, so you can really make sure to clear all the fatigue and know for sure you're recovered. And the second part of the answer is, you should feel from a systemic perspective and to just wiggling your body around and are there any kinks in and, and pieces of soreness in it, uh, you should know you're recovered. Again, if you don't, if you think you're not recovered, you need more time to recovery because you've got another macro cycle coming up. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like if you have a really big drive ahead of you, it starts at 12 PM and you wake up at 7 AM and you're like, oh, I think I could go back to sleep and get a few more hours of sleep. Just do it. Cause you're going to have a big drive. You're going to want to be awake. It's not one of those things you question it. Put the icing on the cake. James, what do you think? I, so like I, my brain went a slightly different direction and I really liked the question again. Also, uh, uh, Montes always delivers really good ones and always comes up with like weird nitpicky issues. So right. The, 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 the baseline way to answer that question is like, okay, well, are you recovered? The easiest way to answer is like, can you do what you would normally expect to do at whatever volumes and intensities that are set, right? So the problem that you run into in this situation is after you do the deload and maybe you had a whole macro cycle or maybe even just a block of using these particular movements, 
when you swap in for the new movements and you're trying to figure out, am I sufficiently recovered for this new macro or this new block? You have all these new movements and now you have kind of the calibration period for your new movements, which is usually like slightly worse than you would normally be had you been dialed in to those movements. So typically what you will see is like week one, you might get a false uh, positive hit on, did my performance go down? Right. And it's like, no, you just, you were doing high bar squats and you switched to front squats and you just kind of suck at front squats for now. But a week from now, you'll be right back to where you were. So it's an interesting question. There are a lot of different boxes you can kind of look at in terms of perception of fatigue, you know, relative effort, all those things. Yeah. So sometimes, as Dr. Mike said, it's good to take that active rest phase. And one of the things that you can do is kind of sneak some of those new exercises in during that active rest phase, even if you're not training them super hard, which active rest, you really shouldn't be training super hard. But like if you know you're going to do a movement that takes a little while to get going, like just as a front squat, for example, because it's a little more complicated, sneak that in there so you can have like a week or two of practice. That way, when you actually start training it, you'll have a better idea of where that baseline is and where you are now. And then you can kind of make that decision. Yeah. And, and guys, remember the systemic and local perceptive fatigue is really important at the beginning of the macro cycle. Look, yeah, your squat might be lower because you haven't been practicing high bar squatting. You've just been doing front squats for a whole macro. Fine. But how do those squats feel? At the beginning of the macro, you should be getting into the bar. You should feel real flexible, really limber. Your muscles for a few reps should get a real decent pump and just really perturbed. You know, holy shit. Joints should feel really good. You should feel excited or ready to train. You shouldn't feel burdened. If you don't feel all those things, then you need more recovery maybe. But if you feel all those things, but then your squat performance is down, Look, it's almost certainly down due to technical factors and it's not down because you're fucked up because somebody be like, damn, your squat's down. Maybe you're not recovered. And you're like, I feel recovered in every possible way. So what gives? And they're like, well, yeah, I guess you're probably recovered. So it's not, I'll tell you this, when you're under recovered and you're an advanced trainer like yourself, Montas, it's not really a mystery. You know, like you fucking know, like right now I'm post bodybuilding show and I'm training pretty hard to catch a bit of the rebound before I taper things down a bit and go into act. I don't feel a hundred percent. I don't have to lie to myself. Right? So, but after active rest, I know how I'm just going to be like, like a trillion bucks. It's, it's part of that perceptive systemic feel. Totally. You know, the situation I'm thinking of right now that comes to my mind is Mike. I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but uh, have you ever taken like a long time off of heavy barbell pressing? Like you did a lot of dumbbell oh, yeah. stuff or maybe a lot of flies. And then all of a sudden yep. you you have like a wide yep. grip bench programmed in and you're like, Oh, what? What? Yep. Max yes. goes from 500 to 315. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then I'm struggling the next week with two you're plates. like, okay, this is fine. And then the third week you're like, yeah, I'm back in business, baby. But that first week yeah, or two, 100%. Saying, oh, what? I've had a Smith machine shoulder press go up by 100 pounds over the course of six months. Like <laughs> that's, I didn't actually gain a hundred pounds on my pressing folks. It's just all tech because the first time I did it, I was like, doing like 225 for a set of 10. And I was like, Ugh. But I knew it. Like I was recovered super well, chest wise, shoulder, tricep, but everything felt wrong. Like the movement felt wrong. And then I learned to do the movement a little better. My body got used to it, used to it, used to it. And then like six months later, I was legit. I did 325 for 10 uh, in the overhead press on the Smith machine. And I was like, Okay. I would just, every week I would just add five pounds and my RIR just never went down. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. That's one of those things where technique's a big deal and it takes a lot of time to get used to it. So you have to rely on other factors as well. Mm -hmm. Nice question. All right. L-A-V. Oh, right. Lav. Bam. All right there. Perfect. Oh, ours look really similar now. That's really cool. Oh, good. I love that sport. What evidence is there for resensitization phases or the phenomenon uh, or is it a misnomer? Can you please elaborate? So, oh, I had some good stuff too. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll start it off and then Dr. Mike will, will take it further. So the evidence for that actually came from tapering literature because the taper is such a huge reduction in um, training volume that what they found afterwards is that the athletes were much more responsive to training in the period following a taper. And so if you actually read like some of the classic tapering literature, like Mujica, 
That is listed as one of the benefits of tapering is resensitizing the athlete to training stimuli. And so we've, and you know, that has been expounded upon to look at things like deloads and active rest phases. And what, what do we find that? Yeah, that's generally true. You take a reduction in the training volume and you resensitize the athlete to the training stimulus. Same thing goes with variation and, and other things like that. Um, so that's where that came from. No one generally calls it a resensitization phase. That's just kind of the, the term that we have adopted because we think it's um, just more, Literally descriptive. Descriptive, of what's going yeah. on. More applicable, right? So you wouldn't <laughs> yeah. tell someone to taper for uh, for getting this effect. Yeah. You tell I'm them not peaking, wanna, right? Yeah, exactly. You're just telling them that this is a phase with a distinct goal of resensitizing to training. So if you if you do a PubMed search for like resensitization phase, you won't find shit. So this is just kind of like you, you, uh, the middle ground between the exercise science literature and then kind of like the strength and conditioning world. We take both of those and we put something in the middle and we say, hey, this is something both of us can understand and it's easy to implement. Yeah. Super. If you're looking for some newer references, specifically in lifting, I would uh, seek out James Krieger's volume Bible, which talks about uh, resensitization to a considerable extent and shows some studies. Specifically, there's one really good study where they trained one group continuously, and then they trained another group. They trained for a few weeks, and they just wouldn't train. And they trained for a few weeks, and they wouldn't train. And they trained for a few weeks, and then they measured. And that group, even though they trained only two-thirds as much total time, got the same results as the other group that trained the entire time. Because that group desensitized the entire time. And this group desensitized re, de, re. And they were just, it was just not, it's unbelievable, actually. Huge kind of a landmark study for like, oh, fuck, are we all training too much? Because, um, you know, you, you see people spinning their fatigued in the gym and they're cranking and they're like, grind, baby. Like, you should take a fucking deload. And they're like, will I lose my gains? Like, no, you literally gain more after your deload. That's the whole fucking point of the deload. And then Greg Knuckles has a great article uh, from a little bit, a while, a little while ago, a few years ago, where he talks about um, myonuclear domain, satellite cells, and noob gains, where he talks about the resensitization phenomenon considerably and goes into some of the molecular mechanistic mechanisms. So it's just really good stuff. Because he had a friend uh, of his that like was lifting for a while and he stopped lifting. And then within six weeks, he gained like 20 pounds of muscle and lost like 10 pounds of fat. And everyone's like, bullshit, this guy's on steroids. And he sure as hell wasn't. He just benefited wildly from this resensitization phenomenon of like, he was really sensitized because he hadn't done shit in a while. And he had been at a high level before his body was super primed. So the real kicker there is um, you don't want to completely detrain so that you lose muscle. You want to go down to maintenance volume. So you keep all of your muscle but get a bit of that resensitization effect and then go back into it. Is it time spent away from growing? Yes, but it has benefited on the other end by growing more. Just, it's literally the same or in, analogy. In, in the case of staleness, no. You know, to oh, totally, yeah. Right? You're just in that not case, growing. you're not growing you're at all. <laughs> right, right. Or like we could say, like we could steal man the argument and say you are growing, but you're growing at these fucking snail's pace, right? Um, you could just be growing better. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, stainless. Yeah, you you may you may not be growing at all. Uh, and also, you know, people like if you have like sort of like philosophical conundrum accepting this, just think about how this applies in every single other facet of life. For example, like, how, are you more productive at work if you just work without weekends always, or are you more productive on the Monday after you take a nice relaxing rest weekend off? There's a fucking reason we have weekends, and it's not like people say like, man, if capitalism was unregulated, we wouldn't have weekends. Like, sure we would. Corporation does not want you to grind yourself into a pulp. They want high quality results. And you notice this by the people that make the most money, the corporations, the people that are the most important, the people that get promoted the most, dude, they get like two weeks off anytime they want. Like the most talented people at a corporation could be like, hey, I'm taking a month off in Spain. They're like, okay, whatever you need, Bob, just come back with those designs after. <laughs> like, it's a thing. It's a real thing in, in many other respects. So it's totally okay to back up. Resensitization is, is almost certainly a very confirmed phenomenon. So, Dr. Mike. I keep seeing your fucking thumbnail for the muscle asymmetry. Thanks, video. Scott Hoon. I Scott, hate, Scott, I hate it, it so much. It's so weird You're looking. You're supposed to hate it. You're supposed I to know. hate it and click on it and then talk shit and then boost our algorithm. What was that movie? Uh, was that scary movie with the guy who had the little hand? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's terrible. I hate that guy too. <laughs> I touch her food and be like, <laughs> no, grab my little hand. Uh, that's what it keeps making <laughs> me think of. Yeah, I, I don't like it either. It's disturbing <laughs> somebody said like wow i would actually uh, be really happy to have an arm <laughs> um, anyway it looked like somebody the most apt one was like it looks like when piccolo got his arm sucked out by cell oh That's yeah true. you know what i was thinking about the other day was the live action dragon ball movie and how just awful that was like an insult to art itself 
And like the Piccolo costume was just so amazingly oh. bad. It, it, Folks, if you if it's you, like they had a retainer that actually had seen Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you guys have exhausted your your Amazon and your Netflix and your Hulu, like look up Dragon Ball. I think it's called Dragon Ball Evolution. Oh man, yeah. it's bad. Yeah. And then it's once bad. you finish that, watch the latest season of Big Mouth, which is fucking hilarious. Oh fuck, I gotta get on that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so good. All right. Next up, Zenith. Who's just oh, three in a row. And then guess what? TJ Cool is on that. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Zena says, "How would you count reps in reserve when training the progressions of an isometric exercise like the pull? Is that called plank or planche? Planche. I think you meant plank, planche. but yeah. No, no, James. I think it's like a famous. It, no, it's it, it literally is spelled like that. It's like a thing. It's it's a thing. I'm, I'm telling you, it's like this weird gymnastics thing or front lever. So, because I'm a red blooded male, I don't train dumb shit like that. <laughs> Woo, JK. Next question. On a serious note, you if you're not doing standardized reps, you cannot do RIR. You need some other measure of relative effort. Mm-hmm. A good one for isometric exercises is number seconds in reserve. That's a pretty easy one. Like if you're like, all right, I could have gone another five seconds. I'm just going to stop there and you stop there and you do that. You do like four sets of five seconds in reserve. Next week you do four seconds in reserve, then three, then two, then one. And eventually you're pushing super hard until you fail. And you should probably only be doing that on occasion, James. Yeah. And that's like, you can also use like an RPE type thing. That would be fine. Sometimes when you try and adapt, like, so I, I'm not against the seconds in reserve, but you have some people who might be able to plank or planche for like five to 10 minutes. And then, you know, five seconds is insignificant in com- sure. on that, on that time scale. So you might have to play around with that idea. That idea works. You just might have to yeah. scale it a little bit differently. And that's when I think like an RPE is just easier. Or you say like today we're going for like a nine out of 10 or a, a max mm-hmm. effort, you know, something like yeah. that. And another one is like, so per James's advice, like, okay, let's say it's five minutes and 30 seconds is your PR. Start next week at 5.15. Then the week after, 5.20, 5.25, 5.30, 5.35, big PR, and then deload or something. Yeah, totally, totally. All right, Mr. TJ Cool. It's kind of an audacious name. It's very, very audacious. Congrats on the show win. Thank you so much. Your back and legs were way beyond everyone else's. Thank you so much. Much deserved win. I have seen multiple interviews in RP, uh, multiple interviews in RP videos recently where you expressed the importance of scheduling the body part first in a workout if you are prioritizing that body part. How valuable is manipulating the order of movements within a workout compared to the other factors you manipulate when prioritizing the body part, such as weekly volume, uh, not as important. So weekly volume is more important. Frequency, probably more important. Intensity, much more important. Um, does the value of exercise order manipulation appreciably change depending on the individual situation? Yes, it is program form. For instance, an individual has a high work capacity. The small drop off in rep strength to a workout might diminish the importance of exercise order. Absolutely. So here's the real critical factor. The only reason an exercise order really is important is because it allows you to put your best foot forward and your highest quality work first. It allows you to get that muscle closest to failure as its own limiting factor without other things, other muscles, systemic fatigue, blah, blah, blah. If you can have an amazing second exercise, uh, let's say you do bench press and you get whatever, and then your real focus is back. So you do pull-ups after. If your pull-ups go stellarly, like as if they were fresh after bench, you're fucking golden, man. Second exercise is great. But if after bench, you're a fucking wreck and your pull-ups are like cut by three reps each or five reps each, eh, you can automatically see like, okay, if I did these first, I would just get way more reps at the highest intensity. My fastest fibers would be the least fatigued. I'm definitely missing out. Exercise order is thus important. The degree to which it affords you to work much harder and closer to your muscular limits during those first exercises. And if you're not really slowed down much, no big deal. But you know when you are because you can always compare performance. If I did bicep curls fourth versus if I did them first, how big is the difference? If there's almost no difference, you're fucking golden. As you get bigger and stronger, those differences start to expand to something psychotic. Back at ETSU, I watched uh, James deadlift 550 for like sets of five. He's just not a lot after that. That's, you know, like, what is he going to do? He's just some leg presses and go home. But if you were to say, okay, we're really focusing on quads, he could probably leg press 100 more pounds for the same sets and reps uh, if he was fresh versus after four sets of five at 550 in the deadlift. So if we really wanted to emphasize quads, we would never in a fucking million years have deadlift first. So that that's the example. Like, But if you really honestly can't tell, if your work is still super high quality, you're fucking golden, James. 
Yeah, that was a really good answer. I think the, the thing with exercise order is it gets confused with the kind of the, the, the classic strength conditioning kind of stuff where exercise order actually does matter because there's a clear delimiting like limitations of performance depending on what you do in what order. Whereas in like bodybuilding and hypertrophy, as Mike said, it's much more nuanced in terms of like, can I continue to have a high quality session even if I flip a few things around, which on paper may not make the most sense, right? And that's usually more often than not, the answer is yeah, totally not a big deal. Whereas like in um, if you have an athlete and you say, okay, well, we're going to do sets of 15 on the leg press and then we're going to try and do some you know jumps and bounds afterwards it's like that's clearly a violation of exercise order because they cannot achieve an overload on the jumps and bounds after the leg press but if you do it the other way you can get both so that's the i think i think that's where a lot of the confusion tends to come in dude we got another one right in a row this is incredible ad eel this was like the best the best webinar ever gift from god what muscles slash movements in the gym do you think contribute to punching and kicking the most besides actual technique slash skill? I'm glad you said that because James doesn't have to go on his mega rant of it's mostly technique and skill. James, what muscles are we talking about separately? Of course, can you imagine if you listed the same muscles for punching and kicking? <laughs> You're yeah. like, it's all abs for well, both. <laughs> it turns out like there is a lot of overlap. I think, uh, who was it? I think it was, I think it was Rampage once he like put a hit on somebody and they, somebody in the post fight interview said something like, Oh, that you put a good hit on. He was like, yeah, put my ass into it. Um, when you teach someone to strike, what we find is that there's a huge amount of overlap in terms of like the amount of hip and trunk that you start using. So uh, it's very easy to look at like a kick or a punch and be like, okay, well I raised my arm up and then I extended my elbow. So that's like, okay, shoulders here, tricep here. But in the reality is, is like you're moving your trunk, you're whipping it, you're pivoting off a leg, right? Your, your leg is actually, the, the big kinetic chain point in terms of you're pushing into the ground, the ground's pushing back up through you into your trunk. And then you're trying to transfer the force that you pushed into the ground up into your hand as you're turning it around, right? So you end up using quite a bit of muscle mass. And in terms of the ones that contribute most to like punching and kicking strength and power, I would tend to say the muscles of like your glutes and your trunk muscles. Now that's not to say that, you know, your, your legs and your upper body aren't specifically used also, but I think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when you teach people proper technique, you find that, yes, having a big chest and big strong arms will help you punch harder, absolutely. But if you're just throwing punches from, you know, very straight on like this, you're not getting as much out of it as you can. So I would tend to say, you know, in terms of movements in the gym that I think contribute the most is gonna be your heavy compound basics, which are done in some way through the floor. So your your overhead pressing, your bench pressing to some degree and like your squats and deadlifts for sure. Yep. Just, uh, I'm going to make that a YouTube video later and talk about that in YouTube in 10 years or something. Um, (laughs) Yeah, James covered pretty much all of it. The only thing I would have to say is once you've covered the, so here's a really interesting thing. The best punchers and kickers, once they are skilled, are often the people that are best at a loaded triple extension. Loaded. So if a guy can jump super high and he's in my weight class, I'm like, and he can fucking and he, when he does technique he can go i'm like i'm gonna get knocked the fuck out by this guy who's gonna kick me into the fucking moon because it's that hip and trunk musculature that let, lets you jump super high um and so the, and that takes care of kicks in addition your quadriceps uh, particularly rectus femoris is pretty important in kicking your abdominals if you have really strong abs very really strong hip flexors yeah like you can use that athleticism to launch that kick and then use those muscles to carry it through and then lastly but let's not discount it a big ass chest shoulders and triceps uh, are super helpful for knocking guys the fuck out they don't uh, <laughs> tank, yeah tank abbott from back in the ufc days legit benched with a super big bounce, but who gives a shit? Uh, 600 pounds. Like, you don't want that guy to punch you. I promise you don't want that guy. And the, the people to ask, because, you know, incel nerds on YouTube will say, technique, technique has got nothing to do with strength. That's a myth. And then you actually spar with people or do grappling with people who are high level strikers or grapplers. And when a big dude walks in, they're like, God damn it. And they're like, what? Like, no, nobody's going to want to fight that guy. And they're like, well, but it's all technique. Like, who the fuck told you that? I don't want that guy hitting me. He can knock me to fucking, he can end my fucking career just by landing on me. Fuck that. So being big and says, this work to quote our professor, Dr. Stone, why do you think they have weight classes? Like there's, you know, once you're big and strong enough, you can fucking hurt somebody. And if you're really, really weak and you're pushing muscles, the upper, you're just probably not going to fucking, you know what I'm saying? Be doing a lot. Even if you have really strong hips and stuff, there's only so much momentum you can put into something that folds over as soon as you stand at the top. So. 
and sorry, I won't belabor this point too much longer, but th- this, this is one that has a couple of a couple instances that I have seen, and especially in like, if you look at like journal of strength and conditioning or some of those other ones where they'll say, you know, kicking and they'll use sports like rugby, soccer, and then even like mis- various forms of martial arts. And they'll be like knee extension, do the knee extension machine. It's like, yeah, you do knee extend when you kick a soccer ball or you kick a rugby ball or you kick somebody else yeah. in the face. But is that really where all the power is coming from? Like not yeah. really a little bit. It's really coming from the leg that's still on the ground. That's pushing up into the ground and trying to swing your whole body and your leg across and hit this guy. Right. That's where the power is coming from. So sure. you'll see a lot of silly stuff like that, where it's like, make sure you do those skull crushers for the maximum punching power. It's like, yeah, that will help a little bit, but that you're, if you're overlooking some of the bigger ticket items, you're probably wasting your time. 100%. Show me a guy with a, a baller close grip. Uh, show me a guy who can close grip incline 405, and I'm never fighting that guy in my life. No. <laughs> show me a guy who can skull crush a lot. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> who is, maybe what were we talking about a couple weeks ago? Change. Somebody was saying, like, should you be able to, like, push press, like, yes. 315, 315 or something? And no, we're no, like, what? no, 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 not push press, uh, strict press. Oh yeah, like that. If yeah, you see that okay. guy show up to sparring, you're like, nah, nah. Don't fight that guy. I need a new gym. <laughs> yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, Inti Castro. Inti yeah. Castro. Wow, this is great. You and I have. This is. I, know, I think we're back on the same. So far, it's the same. Yeah. Thank goodness. Wow, that was this was great. For a while. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, Inti Castro. So that's a question for Dr. James. Oh. You commented a couple of weeks ago that you had uh, to do some serious, oops, some, some sorry, serious, I made up, some research that dipped into learning. Considering that you, God, I just can't read. Considering that <laughs> that and your sports science background, I thought you could give some insights or recommendations about what kind of sports or style of training is best for complementing a highly cognitive capacity demanding lifestyle, whether it's actually improving cognitive function, reducing stress, promoting relaxation, et cetera. Also, in the case you could actually afford to have a week or two of mental and physical fatigue and decide to go for hypertrophy training, what advice would you give in order to deal uh, or cope with reduced mental capacity in that part of the meso? Holy shit. So I don't even understand what the first question is. Let me back up a little bit. So the first question is, do you have any insights or recommendations of what kind of sports or training styles are best to potentially enhance cognitive function? My suspicion is there's no sports that enhance cognitive function other than general physical activity, going on walks and lifting weights and shit like that, going for a swim. But yes. Maybe. I mean, like general exercise is shown to have an effect on, you know, your ability to do various kind of like learning or memorization tasks, but it's kind of like a very low dose response thing. Like, you, like Mike said, you go for a walk or you, you do some weight training and you pretty much check that box. The thing is, like, I would like to be able to say, like, you have a lot of sports that have a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving parts that are incredibly unpredictable. The problem is, is like, although, yes, it will enhance your, your, uh, like your reaction and predictive abilities. It's just within the context of whatever it is you're doing. So for example, rugby, 15 on 15, right? That means you have 14 people on your side that you don't always know what's going on. You have 15 people on the other side, you don't always know what's going on. You have to be able to read the field and react to whatever's happening in that moment. Does that get your wheels turning a bit? Absolutely. But it only makes the wheels turn in terms of the context of rugby. It's not going to help you solve math problems or do anything else like remember your grocery list. So I, it's an interesting question. I can't think of any specific you know, exercise or sporting stuff that would carry over into more general lifestyle. Mike, can you think of anything? Because I really can't. No. And I suspect that other than general physical activity, there's probably no such thing. Yeah. And then the second question, let's see. You can afford to have a week or two of mental and physical fatigue and decide to go for hypertrophy training. What advice would you give in order to deal or cope with the reduced mental capacity in that part of the meso? So basically saying like you have some hard training coming up, but you're also like dealing with some stuff that requires a lot of your focus and attention. How do you deal with that? Is that in my read, kind of reading yep. that right? Yep. Well, the good news about hypertrophy training is that you can get a lot out of a little. Now, you'll hear Mike and I preach about SFR, mind-muscle connection. And unfortunately, those are things that require a lot of attention and focus when you're actually exercising. But the good news is if you're an intermediate lifter, picking things up and putting them down with reasonably good technique pretty much gets you 80% of the way there for the most part. So you can afford to tune out a little bit, although I don't recommend it from like in terms of getting the best gains and minimizing injury. Um, if you're having a hard time, really all you got to do is just show up 
you know you got some sets to get uh, on each muscle and you can kind of just go through the motions. And at that point, you might be doing a bit more movement training than muscle training, but that's okay. You don't have to sweat it. I, this is something I wouldn't explicitly factor into um, like a training mesocycle or a fatigue management program. I would just take it day by day and use auto regulation where if you find that you're, and this actually happened to me the other day um, where there was a bunch of shit going on and I had a hard, I had like a peak week training session I had to get through and I had to triage my stuff and I had my Panda planner thing and I just was looking at it and I was like, I don't have the attention to I actually went to the garage, started warming up and my mind was everywhere else, but lifting, right? I was thinking about all the shit that I had to do. And I said, you know what? Canning it. I'm going to stop lifting. I'm going to, I got other things to do. I'm going to come back and do this later. That's auto regulation, right? It's just, I just had other bigger fish to fry. That's what you got to do. And that's how I would approach that. Just auto regulate the situation whatever attention that you can use, use. And if you don't have any to spare, save it, pick it up later. Great answers, James. Next up, Jacob Mess. <laughs> right there, perfect. Jacob. Jacob says, asks, what alterations could a beginner make to a standard newbie beginner program so the thing is, we don't know what your program is. So this is going to be a tough question to answer. Um, once he has been training for a while, six to 12 months, loves to train, got a solid technology and has good knowledge, understanding application of science-based training, but could still not be classified as an intermediate. Could this be the time to increase volume intensity and start implementing some more advanced programming approaches? Maybe not out of necessity, but just to spice things up a bit. So yeah. we'll just answer on necessity because James and I hate spicing for the purpose of spicing. It's not our job or sports scientists. Um, if you want something you, in a fun way, hire a personal trainer, buy some folks who ball around. Uh, just kidding, sort of. But on, on a serious note, here you go. Probably the first place that would start is an increase in frequency. Okay, as a beginner, you may be training three or four days a week. You get much higher quality training, training four or five days a week because you could split up the volume more. It can allow you to do more volume. Don't drive the volume on purpose, but it will allow you to do more high quality if the auto regulation calls for it. Another thing is once you increase your frequency a little bit, I would also try to work on your relative effort. So now that your technique is really good, try to push a little closer to failure, a little closer to failure each week of a mezzo and really challenge yourself. You used to stop it. Oh no, that's it. I can't do one more. Try one more safely. Try one more rep. And then it turns out like you haven't gotten to week yet. You haven't gotten any weaker. You're like, okay, I'll do another week. And then you push again and you hit another PR and you'll do another week. And you find out like you've been under training for a long time and you have pushed you so much further than you could ever go. Or you push and, you know, reality slaps you back to life and you're like, oh, good. I, good to know. I am training hard enough. And then my last recommendation, just three to throw out you is um, try experimenting with some different exercises uh, to get a feel for what SFRs they have. Like you always did bent rows, always overhand, because that's your beginner. That's what you want to do. Great technique. You got strong on it. Try some underhand easy bar bent rows. Uh, try some on the machine. Try some machine rows. And then maybe like after a month on the machine, you're like, oh, this fucking sucks. Or maybe you're like, this is great. And now it's another option for me to use. You try an easy uh, bar underhand row and it sucks for a while, then you widen your grip and then it's amazing. And then you have a keeper, right? So because a lot of the difference between a beginner and a, um, the end of the beginner and the beginning of advanced is at the beginning of when you call yourself advanced, you should know damn well what movements work well for you and damn well which ones don't. Like James and I, like if you give us the program, we'll be like, yeah, not doing that, definitely doing that, more of that, and then not doing that because we know what works. We, we're advanced. We have to. For a beginner, you know, James, you ever ask beginner clients back when you maybe weren't as good of a coach? Like, so what do you prefer? Like front squats or leg press? They're like, is your uh, answer? You're like, right. You have no idea. What am I doing? <laughs> so, so that's, or those I, I get the, the kind of the opposite, but same problem a lot where it's like, I really prefer front squats. Like, why don't you just try leg presses? Like, no, I really want shut the front up. squats. Like just do the leg presses and shut up. And they're like, Whoa, leg press yeah. is so great. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Cause they just haven't had enough experience on them. So, uh, so the three recommendations I make is increased frequency, push the relative effort a little bit and experiment with different exercises to start cataloging your top SFR moves and making sure you're really collecting all the coins at the gym, so to speak. Yeah, that's a great answer. Experimenting with SFR is always a good use of your time, even as an advanced person, you're always playing around with that just a little bit. Um, I do think there is kind of some some merit to the, the anecdote of uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like if you're having good training, things are going well, and you're training, doing good beginner training, and you're getting good gains. The goal is not to push yourself into the intermediate category. To it's That's not what you want. What you want is to keep milking those gains as long as you can, and then make the change out of necessity. Like 
there's plenty of shit I wish I could still do. I wish I could still grow over from deadlifts because I'm genetically suited for deadlifting. But now I can't do it anymore because it fucks me up so bad, right? So it's one of those things like you don't necessarily, it's not, yep. um, you're not striving for these training age milestones. They just kind of come as a result of your training. They just happen. Um, so don't necessarily try to push yourself into those categories. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, you know what, Mike, you brought up. Uh, I'm glad you said that, man. Good. I, well, I was thinking about last time you had said something about when um, Goku was training Gohan on how to go Super Saiyan, right? Uh, from from a need. I was going to ask you, did you watch Dragon Ball Super yet? No, I'm so, way behind. I, I, don't, I won't spoil it, but this might incentivize you to watch it. So Vegeta starts mentoring like alternate world Saiyan guy, Saiyan guy. And he... Oh yeah, that guy. Uh -huh. He teaches him how to go Super Saiyan, but in a different way. And I'll leave it at that. Ooh. Ooh wee. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think you'll like it. Yeah. Um, oh, well, hold on. I got it. I got to Uh, yeah. Yushi. Subnautica is great. I find it really relaxing. Yeah, man. Great game. Actually, after the last week's, uh, episode, Milo messaged me right away. Like, dude, <laughs> you play Subnautica. I was like, yeah, yeah dude. That's so awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Gamer nerd. Gamer. Um, <laughs> although no one's ever said that because almost always gamers if they sound like that. Um, James, note to self, I have to talk to you right after this. I have something funny that's not podcastable. Got it. Okay. Last question for the day. You're going to scroll uh, down pretty far, James. It's, you might as well just search for it. John. Like J O N or A O H N. J O H. Oh, my good working class name. Oh, got it. Boom. James, this one's all yours. Can cold slash can cold exposure slash therapy meaningfully increase total energy temperature? I don't think so. I mean, I, it's one of those uh, unless you're doing it for like hours per day, yep. I think it's a drop yep. in the bucket. Uh, Cause you're Is that really therapy at that point. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just like living outside at that point. Um, I think like <laughs> <laughs> acutely, like would it increase your energy expenditure? Sure. But like in the scale of like total daily intake and output, it's just such a small amount. It's probably insignificant. Uh, I think like if you live somewhere that's cold and you spend a lot of time outside, then yes, that's probably something noteworthy comparatively to living in like a more temperate area. But yeah. in this, in this case, no, I don't think so. Your body's also really good at our regulating meat. So unless you cap your knee by step yeah. count or something, if your body is spending a lot more energy one way, it's going to make you sit down more often or all this other stuff. So I would, uh, it's just not this, like, you know, drinking cold water burns more calories. Yeah. Burns five more calories for five minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like does taking a shower in affect your TDEE. Like, yeah, I guess, but I don't think about sure. it because I shower yeah. every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we're assuming John that you're not just trying to lose weight at all costs, but you're trying to train as well. Uh, cold therapy is terrible for training during hypertrophy. It uh, cancels out your gains to some extent. And also, even if it doesn't do so directly in some capacity, your time it's such that it doesn't, it's, it's, uh, it's fatiguing. <laughs> uh, like, especially to the extent it would require to meaningfully increase your total daily energy expenditure. And we're talking about like, it's a lot of you being cold and a lot of your body's like, well, we could be parasympathetic dominant and recover you, but we're sympathetic dominant all the time because we're fucking freezing to death. You don't leave an athlete out in the cold tundra for two days, come back and pick him up ready for the Olympics. He's like, yep, I'm so recovered. Like, get out of here. Yeah. I, you know what? I'm, I, I tolerate the cold really well. Like it's in the twenties and thirties out here. And for me, it like, I just put a jacket on and I'm pretty comfortable, yeah. but I cannot, I cannot do the ice bath. I am a nope. total puss when it comes to that i cannot do the ice bath i i'm that guy who like puts a foot in and it's like no no yep, no, no, no we're not no. doing this. i'm saying here man fuck that it hurts the soul <laughs> it hurts it sucks and it hurts your whole body it doesn't stop oh my skin like something deep inside you is like no nah, i am yeah no 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 yeah. no well yeah i can't do and i'm so glad that the benefits of that are essentially dick uh, in just a couple of cases is it actually beneficial because did you see it all the time? It's funny because we, we wrote the recovery book years ago and you know, lots of people have read it, but they're the people that probably didn't need to read it because they already knew a lot of that stuff and didn't do dumb shit. I mean, not, not all, but, but like, I, I will say, um, there's 
so many people I see on Instagram and everything who are like promoting like the stupid uh, cold uh, chambers and stuff, cryo like tubes the fucker, and stuff. cryo tubes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, they're like getting in my workouts and recovery is important. Try cryotherapy.net. I'm just like, what are you doing? You're a bodybuilder. Like, you should never be doing this. There's a ton of bodybuilders with cupping scars now, doing back shots. I'm like, you fucking idiot. I like, know. I stopped like policing that stuff too. People used to be like, what do you think, Dr. James? And they'd be like, I think it's dumb. And they're like, oh, what? Like, why are you doing that? Like, because we're yeah. coming, right? Like, like no. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, it's one like there are select uses for it, but if you're just training for physique or bodybuilding or anything along those lines, like, mm, no, no thanks. And it sucks. Boom. Okay, well, I think that's it for this one, guys. Uh, we had excellent questions as usual. Thanks for contributing. We really appreciate when you guys ask us thought provoking questions and keep us on our toes. Dr. Mike, yeah. you got anything going on? Uh, finishing up the hypertrophy book. Yes. Yes. Other Same. than that, who knows? All right. I don't know if I have anything going on. I know I'm, I'm, we're, we're all hands on deck on the hypertrophy book. So keeping an eye on that, I know Mel's got a book coming out soon. I know she's, I, I, I don't want to, I don't know if I'm going to, am I allowed to talk about it or no? No. Okay. Well, Mel's got a book coming out soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, yeah, that, that's all I can think of. So make sure you guys subscribe. Thanks for hanging out with us and we'll see you next time.